Shalom and welcome to our program today. Meridel and I would like to uh, welcome you to Israel, actually, to Mebaseret Zion. That's the name of the community where we live, which means announcing the good news from Zion. Now, today we're continuing on in the theme that we began last week, and that is uh, remembering the Holocaust. Today we're going to take you on a tour of Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem. One third of all the Jews in the world were killed during this Holocaust, an incredible event. It's staggering that a people could sustain such a hit and in spite of it, create a nation out of the ashes. The name Yad Vashem actually comes from the Bible in Isaiah 56, 5, Meridel. It says, uh, even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters, and I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. That's amazing, isn't it? This is, it's so important that you see the Holocaust Museum, and it's equally important that this amazing place sits on the hills of Jerusalem as a testimony today. Here are a few facts. Yed Vashem not only has the world's largest archives 30 million documents and library of over 50,000 volumes on the Holocaust, but has also published more books on this subject than any other institute or publisher in the world. And I know that flies in the face of those who are proclaiming there never was a Holocaust. And anti-Semitism is rampant in the earth again today. But today, along with the anti-Semitism anti comes the anti-Israel sentiment and so we are on the edge of an abyss, and our prayer is that it would never happen again. And the only way to prevent it is for you to be educated, to know how to answer the anti-Semites in your neighborhood. Uh, what, a, what a tremendous testimony to the grit and strength of a people to pick up after a near total annihilation yes. and to carry on. Absolutely. We can learn so much from this. Amen. We are at Yad Vashem, which is the national memorial, uh, the Holocaust memorial for the six million Jewish people who were murdered by the Nazis during the Second World War. It was established in 1953 by the law of Israel, it was established by those survivors who came, who chose to come and live in Israel after the war. Many of them were the sole survivors of very big families, of very big communities. Uh, we are, in, of course, in the German part, the first part of the museum, rise of Hitler to power, rise of the Nazi party to power, and the anti-Jewish propaganda in Germany. Of course, the anti-Jewish propaganda is a whole part of the ideology of the racial supremacy of the Nazis, of the Aryans, the superior race as opposed to the lower races from an ideological, racial, blood point of view, where the Jews are at the lowest point, of course. The first thing that the Nazis do is basically to create this ideology. What we see here is trying to prove that races are different and what is so terrible about it was these measurements of the skull, measurements of the ear, of the nose, that races are actually different and of course the superior race, is that those people who do these things, if we're looking from the part of who is doing this, are people who are doctors, who are scientists, and actually how long does it take for an ideology of this kind of racial hatred to be able to, if we can use the word, brainwash people to actually people not from the street, 
but people who have studied, people who have learned to actually believe that races can be different as is seen here and as we will see later also in the experiments on human beings that are done in many of the camps in Poland and also in Germany where of course the Jews, the gypsies and also others are treated worse than lab animals because at that stage of course they're not considered to be human beings. Another very important part of the anti-Jewish propaganda in Germany is of course the usage of the um, stereotype or the Orthodox Jew. Most Jews, we are in Germany, most Jews in Germany are very assimilated, they're very much part of German society. Many of them are intellectuals, doctors, scientists, and most Germans have never seen a Jew like this. Um, Jews like this live in the eastern part, in Poland and the Ukraine. But these are books for children that start coming out very soon after the Nazis come to power, trying to show that this person, just looking at it, of course, the whole ideology of the blood is unclean, and compared to the nice blonde children here, and it's because of the Jews that we suffer, we have to remember the economical situation in Germany after the First World War, the German pride that have suffered because they have lost the war, and this whole idea of what happens in Germany at the time were things of this very much of the anti-Jewish propaganda, which starts, of course, before in the Middle Ages, but by the Nazis is created into a huge, huge things, including uh, films, movies that are made, showing the Jew again as something much lower, comparing them to vermin, to rats. And this is the part of the brainwashing that starts from the very beginning, the part of the anti-Jewish Nazi ideology. Just to show to what extent the Jews in Germany are part of the German society, we can see that uh, from 1901 to 1933, 11 of the 37 German Nobel Prize winners were of Jewish origin, like Einstein, who's the most famous, but of course others. Again, very much part of German society, very much part of each of the society in Europe that the Jews were living in for many, many generations. We are now in the part of the Nuremberg Laws. In 1935, five, the Germans decide that, of course, they have to decide basically who is Jewish. And because we're not talking of a religion, but we're talking of blood. In 1935, the laws that are established, it's enough for one grandparent to be of Jewish origin. So if we think what is happening to a Jewish family at the time, or even a half Jewish family, let's say that the mother or only the mother, or only the father are Jewish, and of course, we have to think of what is happening to, let's say, a 10-year-old child who, because he's half Jewish, for the Germans it doesn't matter, he cannot go to school anymore, his father cannot work anymore. The Germans who are so much part, the Jews of Germany, such a part, important part of the German society. What a blow it is to the family, the Jewish family. But the laws are coming every time more and more laws, anti-Jewish laws, anti-Jewish policy in Germany. Still, the Jews in Germany do not really know what to do. They have always considered themselves the majority to be Germans of Jewish origin. And basically, they're waiting for this to, to go away. And again, of course, 1935, the Nuremberg laws are a very big blow to the Jewish community in Germany. And from here, uh, later we see also with what is happening to those who are half Jewish or even a quarter Jewish throughout, even in the camps. Later we'll see uh, in the document of the conference in Wannsee, which is the documentation of basically the extermination of all the Jews of Europe, how the Germans are trying to deal with what to do with those who are only half Jewish or a quarter Jewish. And of course, it depends also on the camps. There is different, different treatment to some of the half or quarter who are called Mischlinge, 
We have moved on to from 1935, 36, 7, we're now in 1938, Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass, which is again one of the steps in what is going on. Basically, the night of the broken glass is the first pogrom, the first time that Jews in Germany and Austria, which has been annexed uh, before, are killed on the streets, taken to camps, from which many later return because these are only concentration camps basically for the Jews and for the anti-Nazi activists in Germany. But many of the synagogues in Germany and Austria are burnt down. This is done by people, by Germans and Austrians on the streets. Of course, the order comes from the top, but still it's the first time that actually Jews are killed, burned. What is very important here, I would like to show you what was written at the time by Martin Nemmuller, who, is a, who was a German Protestant pastor, who was actually um, later in prison in one of Hitler's camps and he survived. And of course, what he wrote, we can call it the essence of what was happening. The Germans unfortunately knew very well of the human psyche and again, the whole time they tried to separate, take one group, make them into better ones. And then, of course, it's much easier. Once you choose one group, make the other lower, then it's much easier to get rid and until nobody is left. Many of the Jews in Germany and Austria, those who decide to leave, we have to remember that leaving means leaving everything behind, leaving to a uh, totally uncertain future, they have no idea, but still because of what's going on, although people do not know what is going to happen, today from a historical perspective we know, at the time have to know, remember, people had no idea that there is going to be a final solution, extermination of the whole Jewish nation. Still some of those who want to leave are trying to leave, there are not many countries that will take them in. As we can see, as is written here, there's a conference in the Vienne convened. This is in France, Vienne in 1938, to deal with all those immigrants who want to leave Germany, Austria. Uh, we are here just before the invasion into Poland, September 1st, 1939, the start of the Second World War. We have a map showing by numbers, percentage-wise, how many Jewish people are living in Europe and parts of North Africa just before uh, the invasion into Poland. We can see that the majority of the Jews are living in Poland and the eastern parts. And of course, later, what we see, Poland, three, nearly three and a half million Jews are living in Poland just before the invasion. Later, the six extermination camps. We have to remember that there are different kinds of camps, the concentration camps, hard labor camps, and the main six extermination camps are built later on the territory of Poland and Auschwitz also, which is the most well-known camp, Auschwitz-Birkenau, on the territory of Poland, there were more than a million uh, people were killed. September 1st, 1939, the invasion to Poland, immediately we can see that for many of the German soldiers, the Nazi soldiers, it might be the first time that they actually see an Orthodox Jew, a Jew with a beard, uh, dressed in a way that is different immediately. Any kind of treatment is allowed. It's even if we think, who is taking these pictures? Why? Look at the faces of the Germans. They're laughing. They're enjoying this. These people at this stage, it's six years after the brainwashing, these people are not human beings anymore. In Poland, after the invasion, the Germans, three weeks, Poland is invaded. And of course, the Jews are immediately seen on the streets because they look different, they dress different. The Orthodox Jews, of course, and any kind of public hangings where everybody is brought to see that at last they're dealing with these Jews. If we look here, what is written on the trains, that take the German soldiers into Poland. We're going to Poland to beat the Jews, to kill the Jews. Okay, this is the whole uh, 
main purpose, of course, one of the purposes for the Germans is that they need more living space, so they have to invade Poland, more living space for the superior race, for the German race. They don't have enough space, but also many Jews are living in Poland and we're going there to get rid of this problem, which is called the Jewish race. Okay, we have entered Poland. We're in the ghetto part of the museum. Basically, the first order that comes out from the Germans, from the occupying forces of Poland, is again the whole idea that all the time the Jews have to be ostracized. They have to be easily discerned. Many Jews in Poland do not wear, they're assimilated, they do not look like the Orthodox Jew, but still they have to be clearly seen on the streets. It's also a psychological factor that any help to the Jews is forbidden and to see immediately who is a Jewish person, every Jewish person, from child to uh, old people, age people, have to wear a yellow star. The stars are different, it depends on the ghetto, it later depends on the country, but we have an example here of the stars that were worn in Poland in many of the ghettos. In this week's Fact and Fantasy, I want to continue on with the theme that we started last week, and that is concerning the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem in 1967 came back into the hands of the Jewish people for the first time in nearly 2,000 years in this war that we call a miracle war of just six days. Now Jesus spoke about this in the Gospel of Luke chapter 21, verse 24. He said, Jerusalem will be no longer trampled down by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. And I believe this happened in 1967. It also signaled the release of another prophetic word given by the Apostle Paul in Romans, which says in Romans 11:25, Brethren, I would not have you to be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And in 1967, the Israeli Defense Forces astonished the world in the lightning six-day war that ended in total defeat for the invading armies of Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. This unprecedented military miracle made maps of the area obsolete and completely changed the world's perception of the Jewish people as weak and unable to defend themselves. All of Jerusalem was under Jewish control for the first time in over 2,000 years. Since 1967, with Jerusalem back in the hands of the Jewish people, there has been a tremendous revelation of the Messiahship of Yeshua, of Jesus, to the Jewish people and to Gentile people all around the world. And so this is a very important development prophetically in this, regarding the city of Jerusalem. I want to say that today, as you watch your newscasts, you'll hear the catchphrase, pre-67 borders. What does this mean? It means that people are calling for the Jewish people, the nation, to go back to pre-67 borders as a precursor to, to have peace with the Palestinians. Now, why would we not be endorsing this? I believe it's because the Messiah himself said that Jerusalem would come back in the hands of the Jewish people as a sign. And what does this mean? It means that the United Nations, the, the church at large, the Muslim nations, the Palestinian Authority, the Vatican, everyone wants, the United Nations wants the Jewish people to go back to pre-67 borders, which is absolutely opposite to what the Messiah said. So the fact is, the word of God stands forever. The fantasy is that man would like to change what, is, what God has put into place, and that is Jerusalem back in the hands of the Jewish people. Welcome to the Still Small Voice. Today the thought that's going through my mind is actually a Hebrew saying, which is, the gates of tears are never closed. Why do I say that? It's because sorrow has touched our lives in a very real way here in our neighborhood. There is not a human being on the earth that is a stranger to sorrow or suffering. It seems to be woven into the, the very fabric 
of every life. In fact, we're promised a life with many tears in the book of Job. Just a few days ago, three of my youngest son's friends were killed in a car accident, all young teens. There are no words to begin to express what all of us are experiencing and feeling. How can we console the parents? They are inconsolable. What do we do when we are faced with this kind of tragedy in life? Where do we go from here? How do we deal with our grief? It's very natural to be angry. Many are angry at God or what they think God is. Others become depressed. Surely there is tremendous stock taking going on. I know with the teenagers there thinking, why did I escape? Why wasn't it me instead of my friends? And this is a very, very natural reaction. The funerals were very sober affairs. And here we read from the, prof from the book of Job, chapter 9, verse 12. If he takes away, who can hinder him? Who can say to him, what are you doing? Because we cannot understand this. The rabbis say that when these tragic accidents occur, it's due 99% to human error, to mistakes, and 1% to God. In other words, if a person were killed by lightning, then you could say it was an act of God. But when it's a car accident, it's considered human error. But it's in man's thinking to blame God because somehow we know that he is ultimately in charge of it all. And at the funerals, they say, blessed is he. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. They're very careful not to charge God foolishly. And to the mourners, the families, the close friends, as they are leaving the graveyard, we form columns along the side of the road and they walk between us with their shoes off as a sign of deep mourning. And we say to them, strength from heaven, the Lord give you the power that you need now. I want to address those in my audience today who are also mourning, who are suffering. This is a natural part of life. I have been there myself. We have all lost loved ones. We have all been confounded. We have all been reduced to tears, sackcloth, and ashes, as it were. This is not a time that you run through. It is a time that you live through. May the Lord comfort you today, no matter what your situation. We can look to Him. We can leave the answers with Him. We don't have the answers. We have Him. And if we will lift up our hearts to Him with our hands, surely He will come and He will comfort us. I have always been able to take great comfort from the Word of God. And for those of you in my audience who would like to know what the Jewish people read in their synagogues around the world week after week, I am going to send you a list of the biblical readings for the entire year. And beside the Parashat HaShavuah, the weekly Torah reading, is also written in a corresponding teaching scripture from the New Covenant. If you would like to have this, please write to me today. IsraelVision.com, attention, the still small voice. There is a move on around the world to reinstitute genocide. And we're witnessing it as we read the newspapers, as we see the television reports day in and day out. And so we are actually warning people to become watchmen and yes. to not fall asleep. Uh, I wrote Fishers and Hunters some years ago documenting the Holocaust through the mouths of survivors and also uh, Jews in many countries of the world. In, other, in fact, Jay and I visited over 100 countries with our children and this book is the result of those travels. But I say that to say this, 
The desire of nations to exterminate the Jewish people is nothing new. It's written up in scripture. Jeremiah warned in chapter 16, verse 16, I will send for many fishers, and I shall fish them, saith the Lord. And then I will send for many hunters, and I shall hunt them from every hole and every hill and every rock. Well, this has been a heavy program these last two weeks. And that's how it is in the Jewish calendar. We remember the hard times, we remember the difficulties, and then, then comes the celebration. Next week we're going to be talking about uh, the Independence Day and the celebration of the 56th anniversary of the nation of Israel. And we want to say that may God's peace, the peace and shalom that only comes from the Lord, rest and remain in your home. And together we'll say to you, Shalom, Shalom from, from Jerusalem. Jerusalem.